Hello, everybody, and welcome to Taking Stock. Thank you very much for joining me. Plenty of news to cover this uh, Monday afternoon. Hope you're all doing very well. Uh, hello in the live chat and on replay. I also read all your comments. Um, so we've got uh, we've got some big caps to cover. We've got some small caps to cover. Um, I'll probably start with some of the bigger companies. Um, but if you're interested in, in the small caps uh, and the micro caps, hang on because we will get to them. Um, let's just start with uh, an interesting question from uh, Informer in the live chat who asks, do I think the FTSE 100 looks a bit frothy and people should think about taking profits? Well, they're very different questions. Um, let me just uh, remind everybody where the FTSE 100 is trading at currently. It's nearly at 8,000, and uh, I'm, a, I'm a Stockopedia uh, contributor. And uh, over on Stockopedia, they provide uh, a median PE ratio, a bit like the average PE ratio, but basically saying what is the normal PE ratio in the FTSE 100. And uh, they have it at uh, 14 times earnings which to me is, uh, is perfectly normal. Uh, and we've got EPS growth uh, forecast of 8% in the FTSE 100. Again, this, this is Stockopedia figures with a forecast dividend yield of 3.4%. So I don't, um, I view that as quite normal. And uh, I've been, uh, I've been pointing out uh, recently, only last week, we were talking about how small caps are outperformed, or excuse me, have underperformed the big caps. So if you've been in the FTSE 100 tracker, for example, you may not have realized that so many UK stocks are so cheap because the FTSE 100 has been sort of um, pl plodding along in a very reasonable way. Um, it did dip in late 2022, but generally it's been it's been off, it's been performing reasonably well. Um, I don't view it as cheap uh, currently. I think in the past you would you would expect to get a four percent yield from the FTSE 100. That's my sense, um, and you would expect probably to get an, an even cheaper earnings multiple than that. So it's not um, cheap. But I also don't view it as being ludicrously overvalued. I would also point out that um, if you look at the peg ratio, so divide the price earnings multiple uh, by the expected growth, uh, you get a peg ratio on the FTSE 100 of about two because you have forecast, uh, you have an earnings multiple of about 14 times and you have growth um, of about seven or eight percent forecast so from that point of view it is expensive um but uh, again i wouldn't say it's uh, ludicrously expensive uh, so for me the FTSE 100 is trading quite normally and um, in terms of whether people should be thinking about taking profits that's up to them and and their investment strategy and their time horizon so i can't really comment on that um I tend to hold investments long term, so I don't uh, take profits like that. And what about crypto? Well, let's let's save that for another day. But that's my view on FTSE 100. Um, I hope that was helpful. Um, okay, so let's jump into a few stocks and a um, fair bit to get to here. So I'll, um, I'll be reasonably brief on each one probably. Uh, so I'll share my screen. Let's see how we're doing here. Okay, we've got the Vox homepage. Uh, and uh, yeah, quite a busy news day. Let's hop in to, um, well, let's do page group. And uh, this is a recruiter. And um, I think it's, a, it's down today. And I think the contrast here. Uh, is really between permanent and temporary recruitment. Uh, again, this isn't a sector that I love, but if I had to pick a recruitment stock, I would be all about S3. 
Um, I'm not sure what uh, ticker they've got now. S-T-E-M. So that's my favorite recruitment stock. That's the one I always talk about. Um, uh, and you can see that it's uh, sort of a mid cap uh, with uh, uh, 500 or 600 million pound market cap. Uh, page group, I do not like uh, nearly as much, but uh, worth mentioning, market cap 1.5 billion. And uh, in today's results, it's really the, uh, the permanent recruitment. You can see in this table here, permanent recruitment uh, is, re is really suffering. And um, so gross profit there down by 19%. So I think if you're interested in the recruiters, uh, you may have more expertise than me, but the way I see it is that the temporary recruitment is the much more attractive. It's a bit like in the real estate business, the difference between the estate agents who focus on uh, sales versus the estate agents who have a big lettings business. I think the lettings business is really where it's at from an investment point of view because it's much more stable, much more recurring, much more dependable. So, you know, in um, permanent recruitment, you're much more vulnerable to uh, sort of confidence and the, the economic cycle. And so you can see then today, page group shares are down and um, it's it's not a great uh, update here. Obviously, it's um, everything's been moving in the wrong direction and they've reduced their fee earner headcount. I, I mean, look, this is still best in, you know, in terms of prestige, in terms of reputation, it's an absolutely great uh, business, of course, page group but um, not my favorite investment uh, right now. Um, will we see if we get uh, anything else on the outlook that's of interest? Yeah, no, I think we'll just leave that there, but um, that's my view on page group, not my favorite recruitment stock. I thought I'd give it a mention in passing. Um, let's move on now to um, Mighty. So this is in support services, MTO. Uh, yeah, so support services, um, you know, this is a big, reputable business, market cap once 1.6 billion. And um, I thought it was noteworthy that they announced another 50 million pounds in share buybacks. That is a big number in absolute terms, 50 million pounds. But, you know, relative to the market cap, that is a decent chunk of shares that they're taking out, another couple of percent. And uh, today's trading update was excellent. Uh, so, you know, this can be a tricky sector. Uh, support services and facilities management uh, can be very difficult. Uh, but um, this uh, this is great, a fantastic update uh, from a mid-cap company. Um, all medium-term targets met or significantly exceeded. Uh, revenue up 11% year on year and profits growing at a faster rate than that. Uh, so profits up uh, over 20% in terms of operating profit to at least 200 million pounds. Uh, so uh, pro probably quite a, a decent multiple as well, a decent earnings multiple uh, in terms of offering some cheapness there. And um, they've, they've got here uh, a net debt position that's very uh, very modest, I would argue, relative to the size of the company, 85 million pounds of net debt, uh, not too much at all, in my opinion. And so that gives them the confidence to buy back another 50 million pounds of shares. Uh, the CEO uh, says, we are pleased with the performance of the business, record revenue and operating profit, operating margin 4.5%, Strong free cash flow, free cash flow generation, and returning surplus funds to shareholders by buybacks. So, uh, nothing really to dislike in this update, and um, I, I'm uh, I'm not uh, you know I I find as I said this sector is a difficult one because it, things can go wrong and do go wrong. Margins are very low, so profits will will fluctuate accordingly. But um, as you can see here, we've got this net debt to EBITDA multiple target of 0.5 to 1.5x. 
So uh, this is quite a recent um, realization that I've come to personally is that um, I think a net debt to EBITDA multiple of 1x is perfectly reasonable. Um, you know, most of my favorite stocks do have a net cash position. But for those companies who want to be a little bit more aggressive, um, I think that this sort of leverage multiple is quite reasonable, speaking generally. And so I've no no problem with that policy, that plan there whatsoever from from Mighty. And um, yeah, everything everything looking good there. So a nice update. And the shares are up by 7%. Okay, and uh, we've got a question in the live chat from Matt. Am I still relatively positive on the fund management sector? Lion Trust, Premier Mighton, Polar. Uh, the answer is yes, I am. Um, if you're a Stockopedia subscriber, I've been writing about Ashmore and Polar today. And I think... Last week, I did discuss uh, Polar Capital's results in this show. Polar Capital had an excellent trading update with uh, flows turning positive uh, marginally for uh, a quarter. And um, you do have to be careful. I mean, you can, you can either be very selective or you can just buy a basket of these fund management companies um, if you're interested in them. But I... Uh, I tend to like most of them or all of them. Um, big differences. Uh, it's a big question you've asked me, Matt. So maybe I should leave it there. But yes, I am positive. I think um, I think the valuations are are incredibly attractive, and uh, and I'm a fan. Okay, so let's move on to something else. Um, let's look at a smaller company. Uh, let's take go over to Audio Boom. So I've been um, talking about this one a lot recently, and I've pointed out that they do like to publish um, a lot of uh, announcements to the stock exchange audio boom. And we've got, uh, you know, we've had a whole bunch of them there in March and April, and then we've got more news today. We've got final results and a Q1 trading update. And there's some media on the Vox uh, website. Uh, that you could check out. Um, we've got 2023. We've got a discussion about Audio Boom from last year. Um, but yeah, I've been a skeptic on this company. Um, I've made the point that I think they're trying to build an audience uh, very expensively and at great difficulty. You know, I suppose as somebody who has produced a fair amount of online content. Uh, I think I have a little bit of insight into audiences uh, or how successful people create an audience. I wouldn't, not that I've, I've generated massive audiences myself, but um, I think when you try, try to create an audience, there are sort of organic ways to do it and there are more artificial ways to do it. And to me, Audio Boom is doing it uh, somewhat artificially by simply spending a lot of money on content. And I think that that is a tough road to go down. And um, you can see these final results uh, tell a story of a company that, that has been struggling. Uh, you see revenues in 2023 actually fell from 75 to $65 million. Uh, there was an adjusted EBITDA loss, which you never want to see, of course. Um, and um, there was a little bit of growth in monthly downloads, up 4% on the prior year. But they do say that they will get back to adjusted EBITDA profitability this year. And they've got a Q1 update as well. Uh, let's just scroll down to the numbers here because uh, these numbers do um, do tell, tell a story, you know, in facts. Uh, see here we've got an adjusted EBITDA loss, and, um, and and a fairly large operating loss. And so um, it's, you know, you never want to see a, a big gap there. And unfortunately, this is a big gap. Um, we've got share-based payments that are significant 
And then we've got these large owner's contracts, loss and provision. So the previous way that the company was working, uh, spending basically too much, uh, and it's just not worked out. So they've sort of written off their previous strategy as basically contracts that didn't work out. You see here, they've got an onerous contract provision up here in cost of sales as well. But they're looking at a new strategy. Um, we'll just scroll up a little bit here. Um, yeah, so uh, where's their strategy bit? Yeah, so here's their strategy. Um, so they say they've got an efficient, scalable platform with all these channels and thousands of advertisers. Um, so what they're trying to do is expand the Audio Boom Creator Network, where we platform the world's leading podcasts. And they've got three clearly differentiated advertising products to support the content growth, premium advertising, uh, showcase, and sonic. So, I mean, look, they've clearly put a lot of thought into it. They do have a strategy. They have changed their strategy from a previous one, which wasn't really working. Uh, so hopefully they can become a more sort of uh, mature business. I mean, it, could, could we compare it to Spotify? Could we compare it to um, the podcast platforms uh, produced by... Uh, the likes of Google and Apple? No, we couldn't. But maybe we could sort of think of it as a, as a sort of a Spotify. Um, but I think I think it's a pretty difficult. It's a very difficult thing that they're trying to do, um, you know. And so I think it's right to be skeptical. Um, but hopefully they will they will prove prove the skeptics wrong. You know, a lot of people thought that Amazon wasn't going to work out. Eventually, it did. Um, a lot of people thought Netflix would, would event would, wasn't going to work out, and it's done it's done pretty well. So, look, they ha they're ambitious and they have a new strategy. So, good luck. But I think it's a very difficult thing that they're trying to do, and um, the losses do tell a story. We've got a Q1 trading update showing revenue up 11 percent. So, a decent revenue growth number, uh, but not spectacular for a young company. Um, and we've got um, okay, highest revenue month for the company. Fair enough. Uh, Q1 adjusted EBITDA profit of basically just above break even. And uh, But you've got to be very careful there because I would expect a large gap between adjusted EBITDA and the operating profit or operating loss. So we've got to watch out for that. Um, so, yeah, I'm... Uh, I'm a, I'm a skeptic, but I'll try to keep an open mind, and um, hopefully they can uh, they can this will eventually work out. But it, it has been around for a while now. It's not a it's not a brand new company. It's been uh, you know I've, we've been looking at it for quite a few years at this point. So um, anyway, that's the story with Audio Boom. It's down 11% today. Market cap 44 million pounds. Okay, um, let's go on to something a bit more positive. I'll try to mix it up between the good news and the bad news stories. So Reynolds is a good news story, uh, up by 4% today. And um, this company is, uh, is in the power transmission business, uh, power transmission products that have a very wide range of applications. It seems to be a pretty good quality small cap, still less than a hundred million pound market cap, but a very reputable business. And uh, we've got a good trading update from Reynolds today. So, I, I, sorry, they describe themselves as a supplier of industrial chains and related power transmission products. So, this trading uh, update. You know, I'm surprised that the shares are only up by four percent. Uh, today when they expect results to be materially ahead of current market expectations. So for me, materially ahead, generally you expect quite a decent uh, improvement in the share price, but only up by 4%. Um, the strong momentum continued anyway. 
adjusted operating profit approximately 20% higher than the pr prior year, driven by a further improvement in margin. I suppose the main reason you could be skeptical of this one is that revenue hasn't really gone anywhere. And I would, in this particular case, I would focus on that 2.3% reduction in revenue when taking currency headwinds into account. So in this case, I would um, I would focus on that, um, but you, you can also bear in mind, I suppose, that if they hadn't suffered uh, the exchange rate problem, they would have been uh, it would have been up slightly. Um, but yeah, that's the main difficulty with the stock. Uh, no real revenue growth this year. Um, but they're chugging along and these numbers are fine. Or order intake up 7%, nothing, no problem there. Big order book and good, good uh, strong cash conversion. So overall, an excellent update. Um, again, the revenue is the only issue here. But apart from that, it's a good quality company, I think. I think the metrics, the quality metrics have been decent here and uh, and a good balance sheet. So um, not a, a very, very reputable stock there and a good quality small cap. Um, so it's not, uh, there's there are plenty of good quality small caps to, to choose from, uh, you know, if you, uh, if you're willing to study, study widely. Okay, so that's Reynolds uh, with good news. Um, I suppose I'll just do a quick, a bad news story uh, because I did mention this one last week and I noticed that on the Vox homepage, Horizonte Minerals is actually the number one most read RNS today. So I am trying to get, look at some of the most read RNS announcements. However, I acknowledge that uh, some of them can be, uh, you know, they can be some very small companies where. Um, the prospects aren't great sometimes. So in the case of Horizonte, the, um, this one is, looks like it's finished now. Um, the share price has gone to basically zero. And um, unfortunately it's, uh, it, I mean, there's a one sentence we need to look at here. The company does not believe that any of the options it's currently uh, exploring are likely to recover any value for the company's shareholders. So that one is uh, is looking very likely to be a zero. And um, I must uh, thank the person in the live chat uh, a week or two ago who pointed out to me that it was heading for uh, that it was bust. Uh, so thank you for that for uh, for giving me that tip off. Um, it does look uh, like it is a zero, uh, but I, we did. Uh, I think we were expecting that uh, based on the previous corporate update. Uh, so bad, bad luck to anybody holding that one. Um, but hopefully you were uh, prepared for it. Um, in terms of good news, um, 88 Energy. That's I think this is up here as well. So one of the top most read RNS statements. 88 Energy has uh, a second light oil discovery. So we've got an entire article on this on the Vox homepage, if you're interested to explore that further. Uh, so this is up in Alaska, and um, they've got two, two flow tests, and we've got another discovery. So good news there. I, I'm not, a, uh, not an expert in this company, but we've got an, a nice article here that you can read if you're interested to look into that one in more detail. Um, okay, uh, let's move on to, uh, let's go back to the slightly bigger companies, shall we? Um, I was going to have a look at Kynos. Uh, so this is a digital transformation company, and you can see it's uh, reasonably sized, 1.2 billion pounds, uh, and it's a year-end trading update. So... I always find this one a little bit uh, strange because it's um, it's basically a specialist in Workday, and uh, you know Workday is very uh, very useful software, but um, we've basically got a company here where 
its main focus is seems to be uh, implementing Workday for other businesses. So I suppose that would raise a question in my mind uh, about the longevity of of that business because um, you're sort of tied to the success of Workday and you're tied to people needing help with Workday. So I'm not, you know, that would raise a question for me definitely about longevity, but um, the company has been doing pretty well. Let's, um, before we read the trading update in more detail, let's just see what sort of uh, figures we've got here. You can see we've got, uh, now this only goes to March 23, but you can see that the profits um, historically have been quite impressive and the margins uh, are quite good as well. So 54 million pounds of pre-tax profit on 370 million pounds of revenue. These are pretty impressive numbers for, for a company that's basically providing uh, sort of IT consultancy or tech consultancy to enterprises. Um, so it has been a good a good performer from that point of view. Share price uh, less impressed over the past year. But anyway, let's um, let's check out this trading update. The board expects to deliver solid growth in revenues and strong growth in adjusted PBT for the year. This will result in revenues being slightly below and adjusted PBT being in line with consensus forecasts. And uh, kudos to the company for giving us the sell side analyst uh, consensus numbers down here. So we've got revenue of up to 404 million pounds, but uh, the company is not going to hit that. And then we've got adjusted PBT of between 72 and 78 million pounds. So that's going to come in in line. So um, again, these are pretty good profit margins, I would suggest. Uh, excellent profit margins for a company in this sector. And um, they use the phrase resilient, which we've seen many companies mention uh, in the past week or two. Uh, resilient and challenging being the two most popular words from companies in the past uh, in the past few weeks so they are resilient in the current economic climate particularly in the workday products and services segments so workday is really doing very well for them we believe that given the macroeconomic environment we have maintained the appropriate balance between growth international expansion investment for the future and profitability so, um, uh, yeah, an impressive update overall, I would say. Uh, a slight miss on revenues, of course, but still hitting the adjusted profits uh, estimate. So I don't think investors sh can really complain too much about that. And, um, and they say they've got a robust pipeline and a strong balance sheet. So, um, yeah, decent stuff there from Kynos. Um, I, I'm still probably going to remain a little nervous about the, the longevity of providing Workday consultancy. Uh, you know, if I loved Workday, I could always buy shares in Workday, a uh, US listed tech company. I, you know, if I, if, I, if I loved Workday, I could do that. Um, and maybe that would be my first choice uh, rather than Kynos. But there's, there's no arguing against those profit margins, which are top notch. Okay, let's go to uh, another one. Uh, we'll go back into the small cap world. Uh, okay, so this is a, a nice uh, small company, only 10 million pound market cap. We are a virtual augmented reality software company, Engage XR says, dedicated to transforming how training and educational content is delivered and consumed globally by providing educational institutes and businesses with the tools they need and so on and so on. Uh, quite a long description, but kind of gets the point across. And uh, so we've got final results from Engage XR today. Uh, now they've had to raise money. Uh, they've had to raise uh, 10 and 0.5 million euros in 2023, but they did finish 2023 with nearly 8 million euros. So 
uh, that's always the the question around cash burn when you're looking at these early stage companies how fast are they burning cash and will they you know if you're investing in the shares you need to have some idea about how long they're going to go before they need to raise more funds because well in my opinion if you invest in one of these companies you need to be comfortable with the idea that they're going to raise more funds or uh, maybe you could conclude that they won't need to which would be the best case scenario so in this case we have an EBITDA loss of 4 million euros which is an improvement on the prior year unfortunately total revenue for the group didn't grow and actually fell uh, so that's um that is uh, definitely a disappointment if you're you know if you're investing in a small company you're hoping for, for proper top line growth um but uh, yeah i mean the operational hi highlights sound good and uh, in terms of post period end highlights so you know we're already in mid april so it's quite a long time has passed since december 2023 they say that they have seen four of their largest contracts close all within education and training from new and existing customers they've got their first ever seven figure deal with a large middle east based company and in q1 they had revenue of just over 2 million contracted revenue booked in okay um so there's uh yeah i mean there's definitely some uh, positivity there that you could latch on to and uh, we've got a pretty long C ceo comment here he said but it finishes by saying having taken steps to reduce our cost base and strengthen our balance sheet through a successful fundraise we believe engage is in a prime position to become the largest provider of spatial computing services globally combined with a growing client base so uh, there's um i mean there's ambition which you want to see from a small company and uh, there's uh, sounds like their balance sheet is going to survive for a decent length of time of course you can never say that with any certainty um we hope we hope that they haven't uh spent too much cash in um in Q1 or in the or up to now so far in 2024. Um, let's take a look, quick look at the cash flow statement and see what's happening here. <clears throat> uh, they published it here. So they've got net cash used in operating activities of 4 million euros. And uh, I'm, I'm sort of pleased to see that they haven't really got any uh, investing cash outflow so some companies could uh, put a lot of uh, uh, spending into this category you know for example software companies could can capitalize their development spending and put it in here and then they don't have to put it on their income statement straight away because they've created an asset instead of uh, writing it off as an expense but engage hasn't done that so that's pleasing and you can see financing activities they've got that 10 million proceeds from issuing new shares so uh, i would say that's quite a clean balance sheet or excuse me quite a clean uh, cash flow statement without much uh, cash having been um, cash outflows having been hidden anywhere there and um, they've in total they spent 4 million 4.3 million euros went out the door um, and that they did get an interest inflow i guess they'll be receiving less interest in future as the cash flow as the cash balance diminishes um, but yeah so if they have uh, 8 million euros at the end of the year almost and if they can keep the cash burn to say 4 million euros for this year, thinking optimistically, uh, then they would have uh, over two years of uh, runway. So they'd have this year and next year. So, uh, and then maybe revenues will increase and maybe the cash burn can, can fall further. 
and maybe uh, maybe you can get lift off in that way. I suppose that's why we call it runway, because you're trying to work out is the plane going to take off or is it going to crash? And uh, yeah, there's um, definitely some uh, possibility there that this one will will get to take off. Um, so it's uh, you know it's obviously high risk, but um, you know there are plenty of small companies you look at where the cash burn is going to take them out uh, and crash them within uh, say a year. Uh, Engage looks like if the you know depending on performance this year, it looks like they have good potential to 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 have a few years of runway. So um, hopefully that's the case, but uh, obviously high risk. Uh, so that's Engage. Let's look at another small company, and I think this is on the uh, the most read list. So here, here's the most read RNS list. Um, let's take a look at this uh, Corsell. If I may, I may have mispronounced that. Um, but uh, yeah, so this company is down 11% today. It's only a tiddler, six million pound market cap. Um, just thought I'd mention we've got a fundraising announcement. Um, I noticed in the last week or two that quite a few companies were were getting fundraisings away, and uh, you know, obviously the share prices for most of them had fallen, but um, sort of got me thinking that maybe there is a little bit more appetite out there right now to uh, to fund these sort of small deals at the bottom end of the market. So in the case of uh, Corsell, which I may be mispronouncing, um, they have raised uh, over a million pounds and uh, they've got uh, a Corsell director and is, uh, has taken part in the fundraise. Uh, this is uh, an Angolan uh, operation. I think they're in Brazil and Angola. Uh, so high risk uh, sort of uh, business, but um, they are getting a, fundraising away which you know uh, could be worse there are companies uh, which you know in the over the last year or two it's been so difficult to get fundraisings done that uh, you know that's one of the reasons arguably that the number of shares uh, has diminished is because it's been so difficult to get these fundraisings away that uh, that companies have had to basically leave the market so you know i'm uh, i'm all in favor of uh, of companies getting funding, um, but I don't know, I don't know enough, enough about this specific one to say whether I would back this horse. Um, let's move on to another similar type of story. We've got Wildcat, and this one is down thirty three percent. Another uh, sort of resource stock, and uh, the RNS today, unfortunately, is bad news. Um, political issues in uh, in uh, Sudan. So uh, I'm, um, yeah, I'm not much more I want to say about that. I just wanted to mention it in passing because it's down 33% and it's in the most read RNS uh, list for today. Um, but basically uh, due to ministerial directives in combination with the deteriora deteriorating political situation, and resultant security issues in the country that the ministry will not be able to sign any sort of contract, even a service agreement. Once the political situation returns to normal, the government will re-examine the possibility of Wildcat developing oil assets in the country. So that's the, um, that's the notification from Sudan. And then uh, there's also a, a South Sudan update there as well. So look, it's very tough if you're investing in in these countries. Uh, tend to need to brace for bad news uh, more often than not. I am, um, you know, in my personal portfolio, I think probably the most adventurous that I ever got in terms of um, holding a stock for the long term was uh, DP uh, Eurasia which had the Domino's master franchise in uh, Turkey and Russia. And that company's actually been, uh, been acquired and been taken over and shareholders have done reasonably well in the end. Um, but I, I've sold it some time ago. But uh, I suppose I learned my lesson back in the day when I, 
I was playing around with the Chinese stocks uh, a good long time ago. And uh, fortunately, I came to my senses and figured out that they were imaginary companies and the, the numbers weren't real. Uh, so that was my sort of uh, baptism by fire, investing in uh, foreign companies and uh, became much more careful after that. Uh, so for foreign companies now, uh, I don't regret investing in DP Eurasia, uh, but the even Turkey and Russia, where you would think it would be much safer to invest in Turkey and Russia compared to you know, countries much further away in, in Asia or in Africa, well, e even Turkey and Russia turned out to be seriously problematic for, for, slight, for different reasons. Um, Russia, I suppose I don't need to say anything about that. And in Turkey, you had hyperinflation and uh, political uh, unrest. That was pretty serious uh, while it lasted. Uh, but the hyperinflation was the bigger problem from an investment point of view. So I, uh, I ended up selling out of DP Eurasia. I think I must have taken a loss on that one. Uh, but uh, it actually turned out reasonably well in the end. It's been taken over, as I said, and uh, not, a, uh, not, a, not a terrible business, I don't think. Um, but it just goes to show that even when you invest in, in, in countries that, that seem safe at the time, things can change very quickly. And so um, you just, it's, um, I, uh, I'm much more comfortable investing in uh, UK businesses, US businesses, uh, Irish, European businesses, um, feel much safer uh, in, these, uh, in these countries where, uh, where I speak the language. It doesn't hurt if you can, if you can speak the language. Um, I think that should, uh, should go without saying. Um, but yeah, I think uh, I might wrap up today's show. I've covered pretty much everything I wanted to cover today. Um, I appreciate your uh, your live chat questions and, and comments. Um, I will uh, keep reading and replying to uh, comments under the replay because I know most people watch this on the replay. And uh, yeah, if you have any suggestions for how we can improve the show, do let me know. Hope your week has gotten off to a great start and I'll be back again tomorrow at the usual time. So uh, with that, I will uh, leave you with the outro. Thank you very much. Have a great day.